Production. Recorded live. Greetings and welcome to Nothing But The Truth on February 5th, 2015. I'm substituting for Michael today. Michael usually starts his broadcast out with some uh, the top 10 stories in Yahoo. Well, I think we have a real important uh, announcement to make today. It is official. And I'll let uh, Joe Booner, the Republican from Ohio, House Speaker, give you the announcement. On a happier note, a bit of good news. On September 24th, uh, His Holiness, Pope Francis, uh, will visit us here at the United States Capitol. Uh, That day, uh, His Holiness will be the first Pope in our history to address a joint session of Congress. Uh, We're humbled that the Holy Father has accepted our invitation and certainly look forward to receiving his message on behalf of the American people. Okay, it is official. It's official. This is a should be a big event for anybody that's uh, knowledgeable about the Romanism and the Reformation. This is a a monumental event in history. With that, I'd like to introduce um, um, York Glusman of uh, 66 Juggler and uh, Tom Fress of Inquisition Update, First Amendment Radio. Welcome to the broadcast, men. Nice to be here, Walt. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Walt, for the introduction. Mm-hmm. Something we knew already is now completely official, I guess, from the 24th of September on. Mm-hmm. The Antichrist in person will come to Protestant, so-called Protestant United States of America for a five or six day visit. Uh, we talked about that already in another broadcast. Because it's funny, he also goes to visit the city of Philadelphia. So some people will say, well, of course he has to visit that because that played a very important role in the time of the Constitution. I say it's called also the city of brotherly love. And where do you ever think a sodomite in America should go to, right? Very fitting. And it will be very interesting what he says on the joint session, of course, uh, in Congress here. But uh, this is probably things that will keep us busy in the next weeks and the next month, and we will probably make a broadcast on that subject also. But tonight we are found here together to do the ninth part on the characteristics of Antichrist as we found them in the document on uh, remnantofgod.org from Nicholas, who has made a wonderful work working up that page and uh, picking up 26 characteristics where we will, without a doubt, uh, on the basis of the Bible, identify the Antichrist, that he is already here, that he has been here for quite some time, And um, we are talking about the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. And uh, up to the broadcast we have had today, uh, nine already, as I said, we covered the first 22 points. I think um, it's quite obvious that the papacy is the Antichrist. And we will go on and uh, have a reading today on point 23, or characteristic number 23, um, but first I want to ask Tom, do you have uh, something to add? Maybe also to this news of uh, Bonehead, what he just gave there? Yes, it should be uh, with outrage that the American people received the, the notice from uh, uh, one of the most powerful men in politics today, Boehner, that the, the Antichrist of the Scripture is literally going to come to this country and address a joint session of Congress. The Antichrist of the Bible is going to come to the United States of America and address the government of our country. It should be received with outrage and protest from coast to coast and from border to border. It's an outrage, and we're so far from God in this country that we don't even comprehend the consequences 
of such an evil event. And uh, it's it's mind-boggling what is happening right before the, the eyes of the American people. And there's very, very few in this country that even comprehend the horror that is being brought about in the United States of America by embracing the papacy through the ecumenical movement and even through politics. You know, even non-Christians understand that the Constitution guarantees us religious liberty and also forbids the establishment of a state religion. And yet, the most powerful religious leader in the world, the papacy is coming not just to this country, but to address the legislature, the Senate, and the House of Representatives in the capital city of this country. Uh, It defies the Constitution, and what it bodes for the American people, uh, I am. to this country in addressing this nation's house of government, it will be put down with brutal force. And uh, But I don't think we can expect anybody to be threatened because it just doesn't look like there's any Protestantism left in this country. Sad to begin this program with such a, uh, a negative twist, but I have to tell it like it is, at least from my perspective. And I won't take up any more of your time. I'll turn it back over to you, Eric. Um, Well, I think this is um, very interesting in the light that we have this broadcast here, um, identifying the papacy as the Antichrist. And we will use scripture and we will use history as a test before our eyes or before the eyes of our ancestors. And now we have the possibility to be a part of history because this visit that he will pay to the United States of America is part of history. And um, at least the people who are aware of it will now have a possibility to see how some prophecy probably um, will become reality. That's my point of view with it because... The things that he has to say there, there are a lot of um, subjects on his mind, like as one world religion, like the probably coming Sunday law, whether or without uh, an RFID chip or whatever. Um, and that could be some kind of a starting point, his visit and what he says over there. So we will be witnessing history as it's being made. We will be right there. But for tonight, uh, we've decided to go back to the characteristics of Antichrist. We've read already the first 22, and now we are starting with characteristic number 23. That is called, Antichrist forces Christians into hiding for 1260 years. Those the Antichrist persecutes will go into hiding during the great 1260-year tribulation. Afterwards, they will resurface. Revelation chapter 12, verse 15, quotes, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. End quote. And Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 reads, quote, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a path and place prepared of God, that they should feed her a thousand and two hundred and three score days. End quote. The Bible declares that there will be a Christian church that will have to go into hiding during this hellish reign of the Roman Catholic Church as it kills over 500 million followers of Jesus Christ. Well, I just can't read over this number 500 million followers. You know, there are a lot of people who doubt it was that many. I can only advise you to get the book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, and there you will see not a detail, but a very fine um, counting together of all the atrocities the Roman Catholic Church was busy with in these 1260 years. 
And we are talking, of course, about the 1260 years between 538 and 1798, especially the Dark Ages. Until Eric, the I, I, I would comment at this point, too, Eric. Yeah. That, well, that, number, that number, 500 million, seems outrageously high to many people. The, the number that they've heard most frequently is 50 million. But 50 million was the number of lives that were snuffed out by the Spanish Inquisition. Those were, that number was determined by the records that were kept by the Spanish Inquisition. We're not talking about uh, the Crusades that predate the Inquisition. We're not talking about the world wars that have succeeded the Inquisition. And I will add that the 500 million that, that uh, Nicholas is talking about does not count those who died in the world wars that the Jesuits and the Vatican fomented in order to fulfill their phony 70th week of Daniel. The World War I and World War II and the Vietnam War and the Korean War all were, were uh, religiously motivated in order to uh, shape the world to accept the creation of the modern nation state of Israel so that the Pope can fulfill his phony refulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. Again, many people will be outraged that the 500 million quoted by Nicholas is far too high, but I will suggest that it may be low. It may be very low. If when God rewinds the tape and the saints get to see all the machinations of the papacy throughout the history, I think 500 million is very believable, if not conservative. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, I agree, Tom. I think this 500 million is more a little bit uh, too little than it is too high. <clears throat> but anyway, I'm going to continue reading here in this text right now. There is only one church that historically did this act. There is documented evidence to support that only one church did as Revelation 12 verse 17 says the church of Jesus would do in these last hours. Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 reads, quote, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, end quote. Only one church after 1798 resurfaced from hiding that did as Revelation uh, chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 17 states. See this document list in, uh, uh, of commandment keeping Christians in the index of the page remnantofgod.org throughout history to verify in your heart that the real Christians always kept the commandments through history. And most had to do it in hiding. Plus, to see a Bible study sharing many scriptural facts about the Ten Commandments. Notice this as well. Everyone admits that this church did arrive on the scene around 1798. That is directly after the mortal wound was administered to the Pope, as we learned earlier. And it was most assuredly at the end of the 1260-year period of time, as we discovered earlier as well. Most honest historical researchers will openly admit it was the Seventh-day Adventist Church that was prophetically coming out of hiding at this time. The original Seventh-day Adventist Church is in fact a commandment-keeping church that did appear around the early 1800s. Fact is, the Sabbath-keeping Christian Church was there all along, since day one. Historians also admit the SDA Church is the only church with an overwhelming ministry preaching prophecy as Revelation 12, verse 17 declares they would do. And it is also noted the Roman Catholic Church hates the original SDA Church with a passion, as Revelation 12, 17 said they would. What they fail to realize is that prophecy said they would come out of the hiding directly after the beast is mortally wounded. And now history records that happened exactly on time. Plus, prophecy also states this church will have the testimony of Jesus Christ in the above verse, correct? And what's the testimony of Jesus Christ? We refer to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, quote, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, end quote. 
There is still only one church that has been keeping all ten of the commandments, including the Sabbath, commandment number four, that also has the gift of prophecy within, within its walls throughout the centuries. That is why the dragon, Rome, is so angry with it. Those that do as Revelation 12:17 declares causes anger in Rome because we can and have told people what the Pope will do before he actually does it. How? By understanding the prophecy of the Word of God and declaring it to the world. By the way, the original Sabbath-keeping Christians have been busy preaching biblical facts for some time now. Look around you and see that many have done as Revelation 18 verses 1 to 4 declared would happen after they heard the truth proclaimed by the children of the Lord. Some churches have actually changed their doctrinal statements as well because of this blessed collection of souls. I know of Sabbatarian Baptist churches as well as the Seventh-day <clears throat> Church of God. Plus many small home churches are popping up all over the world that preach this three angels message that was first uttered around 1798. By the way, why do I refer to them as the original SDA church? Because that church has been corrupted, just as prophecy declared it would be. On my Roman SDA flash animation page, that you can find in the index of the website remnantofgod.org, I have created a two-hour animation with the help of, uh, of Let There Be Light Ministries that boldly proclaims this prophetic fact fulfilled this very day. The original SDA church is no more a Christian church. It is now a Roman Catholic controlled church. In that two hour animation are hundreds of well researched quotes from the General Conference of Seventh day Adventist Church that prove it has been infiltrated and completely taken over by the Vatican. Where is this prophesied? We read Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 to 7. Quote, for the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out <clears throat> about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, Ye ye also, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right that ye shall receive. So we are now explaining the uh, four times that were mentioned here. Early in the morning, that is like the Jewish nation. The third hour, that were the Christians. And the sixth hour, that were the Protestants. And the ninth hour, those were the Seventh-day Adventists. And in the eleventh hour, the Sabbath keepers of today. The truth is that the true believers separated themselves from the synagogue of the Jewish nation. They also stepped away from, uh, from the paganism of the Roman Catholicism. And they even stepped out of Protestant error as well. And now we see the remnant believers once again going in the only true direction a child of God can go. We can only be led by the Lamb of God. We are not to be defiled by these women, meaning apostate churches. The Lord's elect cannot be deceived. We must follow wherever he leads. We do so only because we are his sheep. And we are most assuredly hear his voice. When the leaders of the church openly embrace error and refuse every warning to repent, the remnants can stand no longer with them, especially after so much has been done to try and make known to them the apostasy they not only embrace, but they even encourage. Are we not a people who understand prophetic jurisprudence? Are we not moved deep within the sea to seek refuge where we can worship in truth as our hearts so deeply desire? The elect cannot stand with error, no more than Satan can stand in truth. It is literally impossible. And this finishes characteristic number 23. I think there would even be much more to be said about the Roman, uh, the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church 
um, when we do a little bit of analyzing here. Of course, Nicholas is right when he says um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is become apostate or has become apostate over the last at least 100 years now or even longer probably than that. Um, there are videos out there and I have the links I can send to you if you, if you want to have them and I will later put them on this broadcast here I'm going to make a video of it um, that you can check out that uh, the Seventh-day Adventists have been founded by Masons and were from the beginning by that Jesuit controlled, because as we all know, Freemasonry is totally under Jesuit control. But now I turn over to Tom, because I think that he has some points to make here. Okay? Yes, I, I've, I've done, uh, I've watched similar videos, and it's discouraging to me, but uh, we have to understand Satan is, an, uh, is a, a worthy adversary of the truth, and he's infiltrated all the churches. And uh, through Freemasonry, the Seventh Day Adventist Church isn't the only one that has been infiltrated by Freemasonry. Virtually all of the non Roman Catholic churches have been infiltrated by Freemasonry, and much of the hierarchy, the College of Cardinals in the Roman Catholic Church, are Freemasons. Uh, just watching a video this morning, it was Pope Pius the, or Pope Paul the Sixth who increased the size of the College of Cardinals. And uh, to that College of Cardinals, uh, uh, he added uh, 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 bishops and uh, archbishops. Uh, he elevated to the status of cardinal, and each and every one of them were Freemasons. It's a diabolical, satanic organization. And I implore people to look into it. I implore Seventh-day Adventists to look into the, uh, the Freemasonic leaven that has uh, infiltrated the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we've got to come out of the churches. We've got to worship Christ in spirit and in truth. And uh, uh, no one can point the finger at another and say, uh, you have been infiltrated by Freemasonry. They all have been infiltrated. And uh, we have to stand firm against Freemasonry because they're simply the Protestant wing of, of uh, essentially nominal Protestants, nominal non-Roman Catholics, who the Roman Catholic Church, through the Jesuits, have uh, recruited to serve in that secret society blindly without their full knowledge of what the organization is all about for the purpose of destroying the true faith of Jesus Christ. That is the whole purpose, to destroy the gospel, to uh, promote a global religion, a universal religion, that is bereft of the gospel, that is, that is totally immune from the gospel, that is outside the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, making a global religious cabal that is altogether against Christ and his gospel. It's an anti-Christ religion. Now, look, most people who claim Christ can say, well, Buddhism is not Christianity. It's not the truth. Uh, Hinduism is not. Neither is Roman Catholicism. Neither is this or that. But under the current pope and under the current Roman Catholic administration, all religions are going to be united all forms of religious error are going to be united under the authority of the papacy. And guess who's not welcome to the party? True Bible-believing Christians. The Can gospel of Jesus Peter? Christ, absolutely. Um, I saw this afternoon a video that was called 666 and the Mark. Um, that was about a two-hour video, and in the first um, hour and 40 minutes, it all went about analyzing not only the Roman Catholic Church, but also the other denominations that you just called, 
Islam, Hinduism, and um, I don't know all these other Eastern um, Eastern religions and all that stuff that were there. And there's more than one thing that they have in common, but the most profound thing they all have in common, and that is why it's probably easy for the Pope to reunite all these religions under the arm of the Roman Catholic Church, because they are all sun worshippers. That is the biggest matching point that they all have. They all worship the sun. They use different names for their deities. They use different signs, sometimes even the same signs for the deities. But that's what they all have in common. And that is what absolutely separates them from real Bible-believing Christians who always put the Creator above the creation. So I just yes. wanted to intervene that little bit. So. And it was the Creator who established the seventh day. Listen, I, I want to have a discussion with the listeners. There's all this controversy about the law of God, the Ten Commandments. We're not under the law, they say. But which one of us would have any other God before the Creator? Which one of us would make and bow down and worship images and idols? Which one of us would take the Lord's name in vain? Which one of us would steal? Which one of us would lie? Which one of us would would commit adultery. Which one of us would covet? We all agree that 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 law is written upon our hearts. What about the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but on the seventh day, Thou shalt rest, you, your spouse, your manservant, your maidservant, your ox, your ass, and it. You, you will rest. Remember the seventh day to keep it holy. And all the time Israel was, was uh, profaning God's Sabbath, and they were punished. What is so hard? Everyone understands the other nine commandments. We don't break those commandments. We know that is sin. Why are we willing to negotiate with the fourth commandment over the Sabbath, just like the Jews did? We're not legalizing here. We're not being Judaizers. If we are Judaizers, then why do you not make make and bow down and worship images and idols? Why do you not worship other gods before the Creator? Why do you not freely tell a lie? Why do you not freely commit adultery? Why do you, com- you do not freely kill? You freely observe another Sabbath, which is no Sabbath at all. It's named after the venerable day of the sun. This is clear in history. 321 A.D., Emperor Constantine of the pagan Roman Empire transferred the solemnity of the Sabbath of the Bible to the first day of the week. It's a matter of record. Are we to obey a pagan Roman Caesar and call it Christianity? I beg common sense rules this discussion. If none of us would violate any of the other nine commandments, what about the fourth commandment? It makes no sense to say that we should have no other gods before him. We should not make him bow down and worship images and idols. We should not take his name in vain. We should not kill. We should not bear false witness. We should not covet. We should not commit adultery. We should not. We should not. We should not. But it's okay to observe a pagan Sunday. I rest my case. Common sense should prevail in this discussion. But I'll tell you what, my years of discussion with Christians about this common sense issue I receive no common sense in return. I receive nothing but empty arguments, asinine arguments, 
silly arguments at the very least. And I am just stymied at how many people will try to defend another Sabbath and have no regard whatsoever for the seventh day. And they call that Judaizing or legalizing when they wouldn't think of violating any of the other nine. It just boggles the mind. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And uh, while you were explaining the Sabbath question, which is um, a very important one, I took the freedom to post in the chat box a link of a YouTube video that is actually um, the broadcast that we did here on Nothing But The Truth about why didn't the reformers go all the way that deals with the subject of, um, of the Sabbath. And um, in the video that I made, I also put some links in there to other uh, videos that deal with the same subject. And I would advise anyone, anyone who listens to the show um, to watch that one that we did there. It's uh, quite long, three and a half hours, but it is worth every minute listening to. I can assure you that. And uh, for the rest, I can only emphasize what Tom just said. Why would we keep nine commandments and not the tenth? Because the law was done away with. Well, the law that was done away with was the law of the ceremonies, the ceremonial law that was written out in parchments and pergaments and was transported outside of the ark, never inside of the ark where the stone tablets were, where God wrote in his, with his own finger the Ten Commandments that everybody who loves God and Jesus has to keep even in these days. And um, it is said in the Bible, when you break one commandment, you break them all. So when we break, when we break the, third, the fourth, we also break all the others, right? It just doesn't make sense to abolish the Sabbath. And um, as we very well found out in our broadcast that we did there, the question was, why didn't the reformers go all the way? We asked the questions, why didn't the reformers emphasize Saturday, the real Sabbath worship, over Sunday, which is just based on Roman Catholic tradition? There is not one verse found in the whole Bible when you read from Genesis to Revelation where God changed the Sabbath day. Not one verse. But I think um, that was enough for that subject right now. So I will turn over to the next characteristic of the Antichrist, which is called number 24. Antichrist is a mother church that spawns many errors. Antichrist is a mother church, and daughters have come out of her. Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, quote, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, end quote. The Roman Catholic Church fits this description better than any other church in history. Main reason being is, it is the only church where all modern churches have sprung out of. Sure, some will say they never stepped into Rome, nor ever embraced any of her errors, but if you honestly want the truth, then all one needs <clears throat> to do is investigate the doctrines of all churches <clears throat> to see where they originated. For example, the most graphic example of all these false doctrines that have been embraced by all the other churches has to be the changing of the Bible Sabbath from day seven to day one. Quote, Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which is no scriptural authority. End quote. From Stephen Keenan, A Doctrinal Catechism, on the obedience due to the church, chapter 2, page 174. And I will now follow another quote that is from the Ecclesiastical Review, February 1914. Quote, They, meaning the Protestants, deem it their duty to keep the Sunday holy. Why? Because the Catholic Church tells them to do so. 
they have no other reason. The observance of Sunday thus comes to be an ecclesiastical law entirely distinct from the divine law of Sabbath observance. The author of the Sunday law is the Catholic Church. End quote. I actually have many, many more quotes regarding the Roman Catholic Church's apparent arrogance regarding the Sabbath change. Look around and you will see all churches, both inside and outside of Rome, keep Sunday as their Sabbath. Yet there is not a single passage in the Bible that says this is what the Lord suggests for the New Testament Christians. All churches are doing as their quote-unquote mother in Rome does. As we learned earlier in prophecy, churches are illustrated as women. A harlot is indeed a woman, is it not? So all these churches that do as their mother harlot does are as she is, a harlot. This is why Sabbath-keeping Christians are considered peculiar treasure of the Lord. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. End quote. And Psalms 135, verse 4, quote, For the Lord has chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. End quote. And by the way, something I always like to add here, Israel is not only the Jews. Israel in the Old Testament were God-believing people, and those were twelve tribes, and Jews, the tribe of Judah, was only one. So we are not speaking about the Jewish Sabbath, but we are speaking about the Sabbath of the Sabbath of God, yeah, of commandments, uh, obeying people, God-believing people, God-following people. That's the point about. I don't, just don't like it when they always reduce Israel to the Jews. You know. This is why we, as end-time Christians, are described as those that are not defiled by these women in Revelation chapter 14, verse 4. We truly do not do as these women do. By the way, as I alluded to earlier, it's not just quote-unquote Sunday keeping that declares the churches to be daughters of this or. It's far worse than that. Does your church do any of the following Roman Catholic rituals? Ask yourself this question when you go to your church and ask yourself, does your church place halos on pictures or statues? Does your church celebrate Christmas? Does your church preach Santa Claus? Does your church have Christmas trees? Celebrate Easter? Speak of Easter bunnies and eggs? Does your church celebrate Good Friday, Halloween, St. Valentine's Day? Coming up next week, by the way. Do you acknowledge 40 days for Lent? Does your church have a steeple? Do you wear wedding rings? Are infants baptized in your church? Do they teach Trinity doctrine? Do they teach an immortal soul? Do they teach eternal life in hell? Do they teach an immediate heaven or hell? Do they teach a three and a half or seven year tribulation theory? Do they teach the Ten Commandments were abolished? Do they teach Leviticus 11 or Deuteronomy 14 are no longer viable? Does your Bible have the Apocrypha in it? Is there a cross or a crucifix in your church? Etc., etc., etc. Well, the most important point to me here is, is there a cross or crucifix in your church? It says very, very clearly in commandment number two that we are not to make any graven images of anything that is in the heavens above, that is here on earth, or that is in the waters below the earth. We are not to make any graven images. And also a crucifix is, of course, a graven image. And when you study where the crucifix comes from, it is an old sun worship symbol. The crucifix symbolizes the sun. And that was there long time before Jesus Christ ever walked the earth. 
is there a cross or crucifix in your church? I would rather ask the question, is there any church that you can find where there is not a cross or a crucifix? For more info on are you Catholic or are you sure, you can go to the index section of the page. Now do you understand why Protestant Church is the one that will eventually create the image to the beast? Are you aware that they already started? For information on what happened in October of 2002, these churches do all Rome has taught them to do. They are indeed daughters of the whore, and therefore the church your God has called you out of. Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. Quote, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth has co have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye not receive of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. End quote, and end of number 24 of the characteristics of Antichrist. I do not think that we can make it any more clear than Revelation 18, 1 through 5. But also we have to remember Revelation 17, where Mystery Babylon is exposed, the woman riding the beast, a woman being a church, and the beast being a king or a kingdom. Ah, Tom, you can explain that so much better than I. <laughs> All the things that you mentioned, all the things that Nicholas mentioned, have their origin in the ancient Babylonian mystery religions. And they were simply adopted by the Roman Catholic Church in practice today. And they were passed down to the so-called Protestant churches. The Protestant Reformation was a return to the gospel, but the Protestant Reformation erroneously kept some of the beliefs and teachings of this Babylonian religion and passed them down to us. And God is not going to accept it as worship. Neither will he accept the, 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 the venerable day of the sun or any of the other feasts and festivals that are today called Christian festivals and holidays. We can't worship God in spirit and in truth by observing pagan Babylonian rites and rituals and ceremonies and holidays. And this is where I find the most opposition with Christians today when I suggest that they ought to abandon this Babylonian mystery teaching that somehow after one dies, the soul lives on or that it not only lives on, but it, that it goes somewhere. The Bible doesn't teach that. And because the Christians believe in the, the immortality of the soul and the tra transmigration of the soul, then the door is open for every other kind of false teaching with regard to the state of the dead, like, is there a purgatory? Can we pray to dead saints? which the Bible clearly forbids. Listen, I remember one time discussing this, and it finally sunk in to the heart and soul of one of my listeners on ham radio, when through the scriptures I finally convinced him that when one dies, one is dead until the resurrection. That's what the scripture teaches and then I described to him, but because Christians believe the Babylonian lie, 
that there is such a thing as the immortality of the soul or the transmigration of the soul, and that opens all realms of false teaching with regard to the, the, the status of the dead and prayers to dead saints, necromancy, the Bible calls it, uh, intercession by dead saints, uh, purgatory, and all of these things that the Roman Catholic Church has made herself wealthy with, when he finally comprehended that the state of the dead is death until the resurrection, he keyed up his microphone and he said, thank you. Thank you so much. And I never heard from the man again because he knew at that point he had transferred into an extreme minority belief in this world. What other errors have been passed down to us who say we are Bible-believing Christians? What other Babylonian teachings have been brought down to us, passed on to us from our forefathers, whether they be Protestant or Catholic or any other thing, that the Bible does not teach. These are the things that we must repent of. Christmas, Easter, crosses and crucifixes, prayers to the dead, masses for the dead, on and on and on it goes. There's even a portion of the scripture, I I wish I had looked it up before the program, it admits in the scripture there'll come a time when when God's people will say, all that our fathers taught us were errors. I wish I had that passage of scripture before my face so I could read it right out of the scriptures. But that's how I feel right now, knowing the truth about all these things. And they all come eventually from the Babylonian mystery schools They were passed down through the Medo-Persian Empire, compounded by by philosophy and other things in the Grecian Empire, and all of it mixed together in the Roman Empire, which is the ruling authority of the world today. It rules all the churches and even the Protestants. Why didn't they abandon the Roman Sunday and take back God's Holy Sabbath? Why didn't they denounce the belief in the the immortality of the soul and the transmigration of the soul? Listen, this Roman leaven that remained in the Protestant lump after the Protestant Reformation is now the very foundation for what we see occurring in the world today, the ecumenical union of all the religions of the world. That's what they all have in common. That is the, com- the, <clears throat> the common ground upon which is built this ecumenical global religion that will exclude true Bible-believing Christians and make us pariahs and make us the enemy of the state. All of these false teachings that lingered and remained within the Protestant lump are now, excuse me, are now putting the lives of true Bible-believing Christians in jeopardy. Those of us who stand out among the crowd and say, Sunday is not the Sabbath of the Lord our God, Christmas is pagan to the core, so is Easter, so is the immortality of the soul, so is the transmigration of the soul, (laughs) and all of these other Babylonian beliefs. We are the ones who are going to be pursued to our graves. Because to them, we're apostate. To them, we are delaying the fulfillment of this global religious hobo stew they call the New World Order. And that peace, the peace, the false peace that they seek and the false unity that they seek is exposed as a lie by those of us who know the truth and are free to speak it. They're going to silence us one way or another. 
by hook or by crook, the papacy is going to silence us. And that's why I believe it is so critical for people to keep your eyes and your ears open to what this Pope, what this Antichrist, Antichrist Pope Francis I says to our governing uh, uh, federal government. Because out of it is going to come an inspiration to this ecumenical global religion. And I think the situation is going to change for the, for the worst, for true Bible-believing Christians. Open government-sponsored religious persecution against true Bible-believing Christians. That's what's going to come out of this papal visit. And none of it would happen. None of it would be possible if people would read their Bibles and let the Scriptures be the authority in their Christian life and reject all false teaching, no matter where it comes from. But people would rather be members of a, of a large group rather than to stand firm on the truth, even in the face of persecution. And uh, I intend to be one of those that stands for the truth as best as I can determine it from the Scriptures. And I'll just take whatever, the, whatever God allows. Back to you, Leo. Yeah, some very valid points that you made there, Tom. Uh, very interesting. And um, we should also mention um, this wrong seven-year tribulation and rapture hoax that is taught by the Roman Catholic Church because that all we only plays into their <coughs> put into the future 70th week of Daniel, which has been which has been fulfilled by our Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, and we made a broadcast on that. And when you understand Daniel um, chapter 9, verse 24 to verse 27, there is absolutely no doubt that Jesus Christ fulfilled the completely 70 weeks Daniel prophecy that was made about. Uh, 450 years uh, before Jesus Christ's birth, around that time, while the Jews were kept in uh, Babylon. And today, um, there is not one so-called Protestant church member that you can talk to who does not believe in a whether it is a post, uh, whether it is a pre-tribulation rapture, or a mid-tribulation rapture, or a post-tribulation rapture. But I ask just to be spiritually honest and to check your Bible. Where in the Bible is the word rapture ever mentioned? And where is the seven-year tribulation ever mentioned? It's nowhere in there. It is just because the Jesuits have been working from 1590 on to take the eyes of the papacy as the Antichrist to form an antichrist that will be just one man coming in the future and then there will be tribulation <clears throat> and all these rapture people well it's just what Tom, Tom said there's just a resurrection there's no rapture everybody who dies goes to sleep and will be awakened at the resurrection and then you will either go up or you go down and another point that he that, that, Tom, that Tom just made, I want to emphasize on that by reading a little quote. It just goes, it takes nothing to join the crowd, but it takes everything to stand alone. To being attacked from the right and from the left, which is just Hegelian dialectic that the Jesuits and of course the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church all together use to divide and conquer to divide and conquer your minds. It's all a mind game. That's it all about. And when we say that you should check the Bible on certain words like tribulation or rapture, make sure that you have the true word of God in your hand. The 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. Because when you turn to the NIV, and the NSV, and I don't know, all these modern 
Bible names, they have all been tampered with. And in all these Bibles, the divinity of Christ is taken out, and um, then you will never understand it. But the KGB is a Bible that explains itself. And that's why we always put the King James Bible as the basis of our broadcast that we do here. So be very vigilant when you think about things like tribulation and rapture. And there's only one thing that I can add to this. And um, you can go to the websites Cross the Border from Nicholas Arthur. He also has a YouTube channel. Um, and he wrote a book that is called The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. And I advise every Bible-believing Christian to read that book and to study his points on that. And um, Tom can even illustrate uh, a little bit on that because you know Nicholas Arthur much better than I do because you have been together on broadcasts in the past. Right, Tom? Well, yes, Nicholas and I have a distant relationship. It's, uh, it's not a daily relationship. I don't know Nicholas as well as you might think, but I know what he believes about the phony 70th week of Daniel that is being propagated in the world by the help of the governments and the, of the world and the papacy. Uh, that uh, that is taught in all the churches, believe it or not. It's a lie. This whole idea of seven years of tribulation comes right out of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, 24 through 27. It describes the 70th week of Daniel. The 70th week of Daniel, one seven-year period of time, was the ministry of Jesus from the time of his baptism until the time that the Sanhedrin stoned Stephen. Seven years of time. It's already fulfilled perfectly. The Messiah fulfilled that prophecy completely and perfectly 2,000 years ago. So... Not accepting that Christ was the Messiah, the papacy, with the help of the Jesuits, have promoted in all the churches the idea that the 70th week of Daniel is not fulfilled, that Jesus was not the fulfillment of it, and that the fulfillment of it comes at the end of 2,000 year, uh, 2, years of church history. Now, mind you, in the prophecy, Daniel divides those 490 years, or those 70 weeks of seven years, into three separate time periods. First, seven, seven weeks of years, or 49 years, then 62 weeks. Together, make 69 weeks. And then, the final seven-year period of time. All of that prophecy had to do with the Messiah and the Jews and Jerusalem. That 70th and final week was the, the week of year, seven years of Christ's ministry. In the, in the midst of that week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease on Temple Mount when he gave his own life, and God ripped the veil of the temple. Now, if you understand that the 70th week of Daniel is over, what is all this talk about a future seven-year period of time? That is the deception. They're trying to make you believe that the Antichrist is just one single individual that comes sometime during that, tribula that seven-year tribulation period where he will cause sacrifices and oblations to cease. They're putting this all the onus of Antichrist upon one single individual that comes at the end of time, just before Christ's return. And so therefore, by, by, by default, he must be the Antichrist, and that exonerates the entire history of the papacy. No one can, can conclude that the papacy is in any way the Antichrist throughout its throughout the church history if you believe in one future antichrist that comes during a seven year period of time at the end of at the end of, of uh, the christian era so the papacy is exonerated and it's only because of the belief of this future antichrist 
during this seven-year period of time that Jesus fulfilled 2,000 years ago, it's only because of that erroneous belief that Americans, Christians, Bible-believing Christians and Protestants would allow the papacy to set foot on this soil, much less to, to, to instruct its Congress. It's only by the belief in the future Antichrist and a, and a future seven-year period of time, the so-called 70th week of Daniel, that is inexplicably detached from the 69th week and a 2,000-year period of time interjected between them, and then it begins just seven years before Christ's return. It's, it's all a lie, every bit of it. If you believe in a future Antichrist, a future single individual that comes during a seven-year period of time, then you cannot possibly understand that it was Jesus who fulfilled that prophecy 2,000 years ago, and they do not want you to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Because what they're planning to do with this future seven-year period of time is present to you another Messiah. That's right, another Messiah, a different Messiah, an earthly Messiah. You've been set up, you've been lied to all your lives, and you've got to come to grips with the truth of this, or you will be deceived. If you do not believe that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel, then you will be deceived. If you do not believe that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel during his ministry, then you will look forward to a future seven-year period of time and a false Messiah. And that's what they have planned for you to do. And I've been in the churches all my life, and I've never been taught anything contrary to this future 70th week of Daniel. And now I understand the depravity, the deception, the diabolical nature, the diabolical root and origin, the Jesuit, Roman Catholic root and origin of the futurist interpretation of that prophecy which Daniel gave, announcing the arrival of the Messiah. And the proof of the, is comes right from the Scriptures. There were people who understood Daniel's prophecy. They understood that the 69th week was over, that the 70th week of Daniel was dawning, the Messiah was coming, and they were down on the River Jordan being baptized by John the Baptist, preparing to receive their Messiah. They knew he was coming. Many of them even mistook John the Baptist for being the Messiah. But John warned them, there's one coming after me whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. How is it that Simeon... ...or true Bible-believing Christians in Jerusalem who no longer had any faith in the animal sacrificial system, they wanted their lamb, who they expected to come for whom they were diligently looking and expecting him. That's why they flocked to the River Jordan to be baptized of John. And how did they know their Messiah was coming? Because of Daniel's prophecy, the 69th week was over. They had kept the calendar. They were counting the days. They'd even heard 30 years prior, about 30 years prior, that there were that Herod tried to kill him and killed every child of the year two, eight, two years of age and up. And the prophecies even prophesied that he would be, he would be born in, in the city of David and that he would be called out of Egypt, that he would have to flee Herod. They knew these things. They were expecting and anticipating the 70th week of Daniel and their coming of their Messiah. Why are we so ignorant? 
because we've been lied to. We've sat under the ministry of false shepherds, lying dogs, false preachers, wolves in sheep's clothing. And this whole seven years of tribulation you're ta- they, they talk about is simply robbing from Christ the seven years that he fulfilled during his ministry. He and the apostles. Remember that prophecy was given for the Messiah, for Jerusalem, and the Jews. And when it was fully fulfilled, Jerusalem was destroyed. The gospel went to the Gentiles. 490 years from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. That's altogether 69 weeks. When did Jesus come? At the end of the 69th week, the beginning of the week, the 70th week. You can't get this wrong if you read it right out of the Scripture. You can't get it wrong. Daniel was heralding the coming of the Messiah. It was all about the Messiah. It had nothing to do with the Antichrist. So why do we all believe in a future 70th week of Daniel and the coming of the Antichrist? Let me tell you something. They're prepared to put up a dummy Antichrist at somewhere during the beginning or the first half of this so-called 70th week of Daniel that they're concocted. And once he's taken out of the way, guess who the new Messiah will be? The real Antichrist. The historical, prophetic, and biblical Antichrist. The papacy. The one who has always persecuted the saints the one who has always said he is the replacement of the Son of God on earth, the one who has always blasphemed God, the one who has claimed to be God, the one who has sought to change times and laws, including the Sabbath and including the second commandment, to eliminate it from the Scripture, who is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, who takes the name of the Lord thy God in vain, who is the Judas priest, the one who betrays Christ with a kiss. It's the papacy. It can't be anybody but the papacy. God made it too easy for us to understand who the Antichrist would be. Paul knew who the Antichrist would be. The Thessalonians knew who the Antichrist would be. It would be whoever replaced the Roman Caesar. The Roman Caesars who were restraining the rise of Antichrist. And when the Caesars were taken out of the way, that man of sin, that little horn, that son of perdition, that Antichrist of John and of Paul and of Daniel rose to power. And he ruled with an iron Roman fist for 1,260 years, persecuting God's saints to the tune of 500 million souls that he killed. And now in the world he is being restored to his full power, even so much power that he is welcomed by our legislator on this Protestant soil to proclaim another inquisition in this country against true Bible-believing Christians. Why? Well, because there's no protest this time. He's going to have a free hand. He's going to have the help of all the media. He's going to have the help of all the politicians. He's going to have the help of the medical system in this country. He's going to have the help of law enforcement, the military, the bankers. Everybody's going to help him put down the truth. And none of it would be possible. None of it would be possible if we, like those who were flooding down to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, expecting their Messiah, would believe as they did that it was Jesus who fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. 
you see how they've robbed us? Do you see how they've destroyed us? Do you see how they have denied Christ and proposed an antichrist? The 70th week of Daniel is over. Jesus fulfilled it completely and perfectly, right on time, just as the angel Gabriel gave it to Daniel, the prophet. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. The scroll is rolled up and sealed. No one can open that scroll again but Christ himself. But the pastors, the false teachers in this world, have opened up that scroll of Daniel and have rewritten it. And you believe the lies. Well, it's time to get the truth and repent of the lies and prepare to denounce Antichrist, the real Antichrist, the historical and prophetic and the biblical Antichrist, the papacy, from its rise in 321 A.D. to the end when Christ returns. Otherwise, you make mockery of the untold millions of Bible-believing Christians that have been slain by the Antichrist papacy for 2,000 years. It's time to come out of the grand delusion, to come into the light of the truth, to claim Christ our King and Antichrist his nemesis, the papacy. And falling short of that, leaves one open for the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. Um, I was looking up a little bit in the scripture while you were explaining what, what I, of course, listened to, and thank you very much for your um, wonderful explanation again, like you always do. And I want to read a little bit from the New Testament, from the chapter, the fifth uh, chapter of John, starting in verse 36. This is Jesus talking here, and he, twel- he says, But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which, which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that comes from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? End quote. And I think everything that Tom just said comes just down to verse 43. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. If another shall come in his own name, that means he comes by the name of a man. And what is the mark of the beast and the number of a beast? It's the number of a man. The man we were always talking about in this reading of characteristics of Antichrist, talking about the Antichrist himself. That's exactly what Jesus states here. And um, with this, um, I want to finish 
the broadcast today. Uh, only if you, Tom, have anything to add to my reading that I did right now or to the points that I've just made. No, you just made magnificent points. He was speaking to the Jews. Yeah. The Jews, everyone is praying for today, right? So that, that they would receive their Messiah. That, that's what they want. They want the Jews to receive the Messiah. They rejected Jesus. They still reject Jesus. What Messiah are they preparing the Jews to accept today? The one who comes in his own name. A name that the Father did not give him. And what is that name that the Father did not give him but the Vicar of Christ? That's who the Jews are preparing to receive as their Messiah. We have yet to see it in history, but I am so convinced that the, those who believe in this futurist lie it is the papacy who will be presented to them, not just the Jews, but the whole Christian world as the Messiah, who is really the Antichrist of all history, all Christian history. Jesus said to the Jews, I came in my Father's name. Who gave Jesus his name? The Father. God with us. That's his name. Only God could give him a name like that. God with us. What is the definition of the Pope's title, Vicar of Christ? The, the replacement of the Son of God. That's what it means. It fits the scriptures. It fits history. It cannot be wrong. The Jews are being prepared to receive not the Christ who died for them, but the Antichrist, the papacy, that has killed them for over 2,000 years. A Roman. It's a hideous reality. And Christians believing in this future 70th week of Daniel, are prepared to receive the same Antichrist, the papacy. The ecumenical movement has prepared them to acknowledge the papacy as the replacement of Christ on the earth. The Pope speaking before the Congress of the United States is preparing Christians to accept him as their King of Kings and Lord of Lords in this new world order. I can't be wrong about it. I just can't be wrong about it. The Spirit bears witness. The Scriptures bear witness. History bears witness. Those are three witnesses. The world is headed for the greatest deception, the greatest apostasy, the greatest assault against Christ since the Garden of Eden. And to speak out against this is to sign one's own death warrant. But I proclaim it from the rooftops. You have been prepared to believe a lie by your pastors in the church better that you get an authorized King James Version of the Bible and read it for yourself like your life depended upon it. But before you ever do, take off the church's glasses, or you'll see in the Scriptures the very same thing your diabolical Antichrist pastor has been teaching you all your life. The plain text of the Scripture makes much more sense, and it's confirmed in history, and it's being exposed every day in the mainstream media. Their false Christ is being prepared for his exaltation to the whole world. And 
the, the warning is the most dire that one can express. If you don't come out of these Babylonian churches, if you don't forsake the lies, you will be deceived. It has the power to deceive the very elect. It deceived me for 50 years, but God mercifully opened my eyes, and he opened Yerk's eyes, and he opened Michael's eyes, and he opened Walt's eyes, and there are other people who are being awakened every day. The truth makes far more sense than the futurist lies they've been teaching us all our lives. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. So today we have covered two characteristics of the Antichrist, number 23 and 24, and I will bring this uh, broadcast now to an end, uh, leave it over, of course, to Walt uh, to say the final words, and uh, we will probably uh, make a, an appointment for next week to read the last two points, number 25 and 26, of the characteristics of Antichrist. In the meantime, I just want to thank the people who have been here and listening to in the chat room and of all the people who are going to listen afterwards, whether they download it or just listen online to this broadcast. I can only advise you to take the words that we've spoken today, take it to your heart and take out your Bible and make sure that you got the real Bible, the 1611 KGB, the only true preserved word of God in the English language. Thank you very much, Tom, for joining me tonight and um, for giving that great explanation that you did also, of course, on the other very important subject, Daniel 70 is weak. And um, for our listeners, when you go down a, a few broadcasts before, uh, you will find uh, a broadcast that Tom did twice on Daniel 70 is weak, and I will put these into videos later on my channel, Jackal 66, where you can follow that also. And... Um, I have today uploaded uh, the ninth video on nothing but the truth that has all to deal with these broadcasts that we are doing here today. So you're all invited to take a look at that. And that was about the evil Jesuit oath of induction, a two-hour video that I made on there. Also a broadcast here on TalkShow. But um, I want to finish by saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Father, that, you, that we have had the opportunity to come together tonight and try to get out some of the real truths as it is written in the Bible and in your holy word. And uh, to all the listeners, thank you for listening and um, God bless you. Bye-bye. Walt, up to you. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, York. And uh, I'm going to end it right there. And I uh, just want to finish. Read the Bible like it, your life depends on it. God bless and we'll see you later. <laughs>